The Bible passage for today is Daniel chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stoop, stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let him, let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowest of people. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting um, places in its branches for the birds. Your Majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to distant parts of the, la of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump 
bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you um, acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar, your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honour and splendour were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisers and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Amen. Barbara. Let's just pray for Barbara. Oh, oh there it goes again. <sighs> Let's pray that the technology works. Try zipping up my pocket, see if that helps. Is it still working? I need to get this. Oh, no. Goodness me. Yeah, let's right. pray. <laughs> Father God, I want to thank you for Barbara. I want you to thank you for the time that she has put into uh, to listening to you and preparing this word for us. I pray that you will help her mind to be clear, her voice to be clear. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be open to hear you speaking into our lives. We pray this for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Should I do something with this mic? Or doesn't matter? That's all right. Yeah, great. Thank you. I remember donkeys years ago when I was working for British Gas. 
and it was my annual appraisal, that time of the year that we all look forward to. And my boss said that I was being a bit quiet. I know it sounds bizarre, and understand that that sounds very unlikely, but I was much younger and probably a lot less confident, actually. And, uh, and my boss said, look, you need to speak up a bit more. You need to speak up about your successes. My previous boss uh, had been very good uh, at talking about the successes of the members of his team. I recommend it if you have people on your team. Talk up your team. It's great. It's so encouraging for them. I thought that was a better example. I thought it was my boss's job to, uh, to blow my trumpet more than mine. I'd grown up um, in a home where uh, I was always quick to be told that pride comes before a fall. If I was um, excited about some success I'd had, some exam where I'd come first in the class or whatever it was, uh, my mum would be the first one to say, oh, be careful, you know, we won't get you out the door, your head will have swelled too much. These days it strikes me that humility is probably not much valued. We, we struggle with the concept. We live in a world where uh, we think it's necessary to blow our own trumpets. Nobody else is going to blow it for us. Our culture views humility sometimes as weakness or as self-deprecation. And so we come here to this story of someone with great power and authority and wealth who was proud and self-important, and then they have their bubble burst in, in quite a shocking way. It, it's an easy story to enjoy, I think. It's easy, it's easy for us to draw parallels with our own world. It, uh, it feels very easy for me this week, quite topical to look around at the rulers we see around us today and, and point the finger. Um, Putin is continuing his war, even when some of his own diplomats are telling him that it's wrong. Uh, one wonders what's going on in this man's head. What sort of hubris is he, uh, is he in? Uh, we've had a week where Boris Johnson expresses himself contrite over Partygate, but not so contrite that he'll suffer any actual consequences. And next week, we're going to celebrate the Queen's Jubilee. And whatever you think of the monarchy, and there's probably a variety of, of responses to that in the room, nevertheless, our Queen has fashioned her, uh, her rule, her position, in terms of service and sacrifice and duty and responsibility. And it seems to me that leadership and authority is a matter of character far more than it's a matter of skill set. But actually it's too easy simply to point the finger at others. It's easy to tut about how nothing's changed with those in authority and it's, um, it's sometimes easy almost to be smug about the fact that those in authority will answer to God for how they've exercised the power that they've been given, even if they will. And the challenge for us today, I think, is to read this passage and work out how it can apply to each one of us. Because it's very easy to read the passage and think, yeah, you see, that, it applies to them. So how does it apply to us? Uh, and, and for me, coming to this, this uh, task of preparation, um, the key has been noticing the way that this chapter is presented. It starts off as though it's going to be a royal decree. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. And now this is my royal decree and I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. But actually it isn't quite that. It turns into a personal testimony. It's a testimony to the wonders that the Most High God has performed in Nebuchadnezzar. Suddenly, this isn't a morality tale anymore. It's not about don't be filled with pride or you'll suffer a fall. Remember that those in power answer to God. It's a personal testimony of someone whose relationship with God 
changed. Someone who went through a lot and who changed. And we can always learn from someone's testimony, can't we? So, what have I learned? Firstly, that we need God. Last week, chapter 3 finished with Nebuchadnezzar praising and acknowledging the power of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and promoting them to high positions in, in his government when they were the ones that came unscathed out of the fiery furnace. But when we meet Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, am I right about this? Is that what you looked at last week? Yes. Um, when we meet Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, it seems that his encounter with the Most High God in chapter 3 hasn't actually made any great difference to his life. Here he is at home in his palace, contented and prosperous. Maybe that's the crux of the problem. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't think he has need of God. He's at ease. He's content. He has all he needs. He's self-sufficient. Do you know people like that? Do you feel like that today? We live in a um, still quite a prosperous situation despite a, a lot of talk of, uh, of, of need of uh, economic difficulty. Do we recognize our need of God every day? Do we look to him or do we actually in practice rely on our own resources? When we're prospering, do we take pride in our own achievement? Do we sometimes take confidence thinking that it's evidence of God's blessing on whatever it is that we're doing when we prosper? It's so much harder to depend on God when we're contented and prosperous. So the first thing I think we can take from this passage for each one of us is that question are we aware of our need for God today are we aware of our need secondly God tries to get our attention he tries to warn us I remember another boss of mine in HR uh, who previously worked, he'd previously worked in a manufacturing setting. I was in a university when I knew him, but he, he had worked in manufacturing. And he told me about a supervisor he worked with, who had a workman who came in late on more than one occasion. He had a problem with his timekeeping. And the supervisor wanted to give him the sack. And my boss, Mick, said to this supervisor, well, have you warned him that he needs to be in on time? Oh no, said the supervisor. Well, why not? Well, if I warned him, he might improve and then we wouldn't be able to sack him. <laughs> now, there's, there's some logic in there somewhere, but uh, honestly, I kind of find it. God warns. God, I know I'm talking to at least one person here that has HR experience. God goes through a fair procedure, doesn't he? He tries to get Nebuchadnezzar's attention. Now the king's a busy man, his days are full, so God speaks at night in a dream. And all the usual court officials can't interpret it, so Daniel comes to him. And the king has confidence in Daniel. He's, he's known to be a spiritual man. Did you pick up those uh, references? The spirit of the holy gods is on you. You're a, you're a spiritual man. You're in touch with the gods. It gives us an insight, doesn't it, as to where Nebuchadnezzar is. He, he recognizes the spiritual, but he, he doesn't know the one true God. And Daniel's distressed. Perhaps this is 
the natural worry of his own skin when he gives the king a, a difficult message. Is the king going to shoot the messenger? Perhaps it's a bit more than that. I, I personally read it that there is some relationship actually here between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. There is some level of trust. Daniel is, uh, is not just distressed for his own skin, he's distressed for the king. But he tells it like it is, which takes great courage. It reminds me of Nathan the prophet confronting King David over his adultery with Bathsheba. He tells David the story of the rich man who steals the only lamb belonging to a poor man. When David's anger burns against this rich man, Nathan tells him, you are the man. Now Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, you've had this dream of a great tree reaching to the sky visible from all of the earth and then cut down and bound. Your majesty, you are that tree. With the interpretation of the dream comes Daniel's wise advice. Verses 26 to 27. You need to acknowledge that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms of the earth. That means yours. And he gives them to anyone he wishes. You've not reached this position, King Nebuchadnezzar, by your own efforts or merits. You're here because God has allowed it to be so. So now renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Nebuchadnezzar's rule is clearly not good news for all his subjects. There's injustice which needs to be put right. There are those who are being oppressed. Nebuchadnezzar needs to change. And change will start when he changes his worldview and understands that God is the one in control. That he has the power to raise him up and the power to cast him down. And when he acknowledges that, first of all, and then he acts justly in a way which is in tune with God's character, then his situation will change. And there is still time to change. And so it is for us. Our worldview must recognize that God is the one in control, whatever it seems like sometimes. That means that no amount of material possessions or good health or good relationships can make us secure. We know that running after material prosperity is foolishness, like the man who built bigger barns to hold his grain but then died and couldn't benefit from any of it. It's not just about the material, but where does our security really come from? What is God wanting to get your attention about today? My husband Paul will sometimes ask me, what are you and God working on together? It's a question he's picked up from his spiritual direction training. What are you and God working on together? It can be an uncomfortable question. I find it uncomfortable. It, it presumes that there's something that God would want to be working on with me. And if I can't answer, then I feel, well, probably I'm not paying enough attention. So this morning, do you know your need of God? What are you and God working on together? What is God trying to get your attention about? Thirdly, God is patient with us, but he will go to the lengths he needs to in order to discipline us rather than just giving up on us. He gave Nebuchadnezzar a year. He could have used that time to change his ways. But his testimony is that a year later, actually, if anything, he had even more pride and hubris than before. Apparently, he did a lot of building work in Babylon. Verse 30, Is not this the great Babylon I have built 
as my royal residence, by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. He walks on the roof. Again, it reminds me of King David walking on the roof. Perhaps the lesson for today is if you're in authority and leadership and power, don't go on the roof. <laughs> and so he's struck down. The impression is of some sort of mental illness. It drives him away, at least in his mind, from other people into a world of insanity where he is living with the animals. He is living like an animal. When we suffer, it does not necessarily mean that God is punishing us for something or trying to get our attention to tell us we need to change. It's really important that we clock that. The story of Job and the suffering of Jesus himself should reassure us of that. But equally, we should realize that where God does need to get our attention, where he tries gently to warn us, but we refuse to listen, he does not give up on us. He will try, if necessary, in more forceful ways to get our attention so that we may be motivated to listen and to change. Hebrews 12, quoting Proverbs chapter 3, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son, as his child. So we need great care in interpreting what's going on when we or those around us are suffering, are, are struggling. We need to hang on to God. We need to draw on the support of others. We need to stay close to him. We need to be listening carefully. We need to try to allow our suffering or difficulty to draw us closer to him, not away from him. And finally, restoration comes when we give God his rightful place as Lord of our lives. Nebuchadnezzar's testimony was that his sanity was restored when he raised his eyes to heaven and he acknowledged that God is the one in control. He acknowledges that all he had was God's gift. He praises and exalts and glorifies God because, note the words in verse 37, everything he does is right and all his ways are just. Now Nebuchadnezzar is able to accept that God is the one who stands the, sets the standards for justice, for righteousness. He's prepared to live by God's standards. And as he's restored to sanity, he's restored from his isolation. Notice that his advisors and his nobles sought him out. That sounds like being accepted back into community. And he's restored from the position of pride, which had made him so deaf to God's warnings. On the cross, Jesus has done all that we need in order to be restored to relationship with the Most High God. When we acknowledge our need of him, when we ask him to come and take first place in our lives, we can know with confidence that we've been redeemed, that we are his children, his heirs. We belong to him we are accepted into community in the church. We are deeply loved by God. So that is the personal testimony of King Nebuchadnezzar. That he had to learn his need of God when it was all too easy to be self-sufficient. that God asked those questions 
of him. We need to ask, where is God trying to get our attention? What is God working on with us at the moment? That God will not give up if we don't listen then he may push harder. Not all things that go wrong are a result of this by any means. But God doesn't give up on us. He does what he needs to, to get our attention. But there is restoration. By all that Jesus has done for us, we can be secure in the knowledge that there is that restoration. So just in the quiet, let's, let's pray. Father God, help, help us to be aware of our need of you today. Help us to lose that self-sufficiency that operates most of our 24 hours without recognizing your presence with us. Lord, show us where you are wanting to get our attention. Show us what you and I need to work on together. Speak to us, Lord. Give us ears to hear. Help us to be open to you. Lord, help us to respond to your call to change, to move on, to step out. Whatever it is you are asking of us, Lord, help us to respond in obedience. And help us to see where we need your restoration in our lives today. Give us confidence. Jesus has done all that is necessary. We can be restored. Help us to take hold of that, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.